Institutes. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Anna Trisovich from Harvard University, who will talk about improving fairness with containers. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So um, yeah, my name is Anna Tushovic and I'm going to talk about improving fairness with containers. Uh, but this talk would, uh, should have probably been called um, like improving fairness with containers with data repositories. So I'm going to summarize a strategy for uh, data repositories to store containers and also um, enable fair, fair principles. So um, this is the agenda for the talk. So first I'm going to give a quick summary of fair principles for the people who might not know them. Um, and then, um, so how they started, but what are, how do things look like now? So what are the new roles of data repositories? Uh, I'm going to also uh, say something about what's happening now in practice. So I'm going to present a uh, uh, my code uh, re renewability study that I conducted in some of the results and uh, we are going to comment on them. And uh, um, I'm going to introduce some of the new tools Probably you have heard about many of them, but uh, they also improve code renewability. And also at the end, I'm going to um, comment of these of strategies with uh, integrating with these tools and also propose a solution that I think would be maybe best for data repositories. So, um, right, so what are uh, fair principles? So they're created to allow, to enable uh, for data, for, for data, uh, for research data to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So what does that mean? So findable, uh, so the other, that other people around the world can find them. So we need to describe uh, data sets in metadata and this, share this metadata record. So people who can search for these, uh, these uh, say observables or uh, generated or reported metadata, they can uh, they can they can find these data sets and actually use them. But it is also important for these data sets to be accessible. So accessible does not necessarily mean open, but th there is some way to access these data sets. And it is better to use some uh, open open uh, protocols and standard protocols that many people can reuse. Um, interoperable, so that means that we want to use simple open file formats and uh, to enable other people to reuse this uh, data. And finally, um, uh, reusable. So we want to assign a license to our data sets and, um, and kind of like modify what users can do with these data sets. So, so to give them the, the, the rights to, to operate with them and also uh, assign some provenance, provenance so they can know how these data sets actually um, were collected. Uh, so how do data repositories incorporate fair principles? So I'm going to talk about Dataverse because I work with the uh, Dataverse uh, team at Harvard. Um, Dataverse is an open source research data repository software and actually many people, many, many institutes around the world, more than 60 run uh, Dataverse as their standard data repository. Um, so data repositories enable fair principles by having uh, metadata by incorporating metadata. So there is uh, also a mandatory citation level metadata. Uh, they assign automatically DOIs, which are unique identifiers. Uh, they also incorporate, in addition to this um, basic metadata, they incorporate rich metadata and dom domain specific metadata um, so that people from different fields can, can understand what's happening with this, uh, with this data. Um, then, uh, when it comes to um, data access, there are six levels of data access. Some of them are the, the first is on the on the on the spectrum is open, and of course there is a super proprietary data set that are sensitive and not uh, accessible publicly. So also, Dataverse tries to have a compliance with community standards, both when it comes to metadata, but also like a standard way to access data sets, like by API. And uh, it also integrates data exploration tools and external tools so people can in the browser see 
uh, how the data looks, how the code looks, and if they want to reuse it. So, however, now in the recent years, years, what we see is that data repositories have a new role, more or less. So, research code is often uh, deposited with data, with like observed data or simulated data. And this is typically to enable ver verification and reproducibility of published results, which means that these bundles of data and code are typically tied to, uh, to, to, a, to a publication. And only in hardware dataverse, there are more than 2,000, uh, and I'm, this was maybe a result from uh, two or three months ago, so I'm sure there are now like uh, 2,500 uh, data sets that contain Python and R. And there are also other data sets that contain like data code and other uh, popular um, code files. So what does that mean? Can we apply fair principles to these code files also? So there has been a discussion about this and a few papers about this. How can we do this best? So here I'm going to kind of like uh, give a, a tiny summary of one or two papers um, and uh, how can we match uh, software best practices to fair principles. So findable, what does it mean for code? So that means that we need to describe code in metadata, provide versions, uh, identifiers, contributors, um, and so on. Um, Accessible. That means, again, very similar. Uh, well, it means that we want to make code uh, accessible, of course, and the recommendation is to make uh, code open from day one from this paper. Um, then we have interoperable. So we want to, again, share uh, code metadata in many uh, community registries so that many people who, who want to achieve the same thing can reuse our code. And we want to also adopt a, a reusable license so that people know what they can do and what they cannot. So uh, another paper also just tries to kind of like more closely match fair principles to the code. So again, we want to describe code in metadata, assign DOIs, um, and then uh, um, enable a free and open universal uh, protocols, authentication if need be, um, and make data available. So we also, want to use broadly applicable languages that people can reuse and um, uh, document dependencies of the code so that it can be rerunnable. And again, um, licenses and provenance um, to be documented. So that is according to this uh, more recent paper uh, toward fair principles for research code. Uh, so from these discussions, we can see that achieving fairness for research code is feasible, right? So we just need to just need to have a good code metadata, which is which is uh, well a reality. We have standards for code metadata by um, um, Code Meta and Software Heritage, and we need to adapt the licenses for co code reuse and licenses for code exist for a long time, so that's kind of done. And we want to also uh, document these code dependencies, so. Right, uh, like, uh, is it, how easy is that? Um, so what's actually happening in practice? So what's happening in practice? Um, what's happening when a researcher downloads this bundle of data and code, and the researcher sees what, uh, what um, packages are used, and uh, he or she tries to pre-install all the packages and rerun this code. So we actually try to uh, simulate this workflow on AWS, where we would pull uh, Dataverse data sets um, and try to pre-install all the used packages that we see. And we allocated them up to five hours to run and then uh, record the result. A result would be a success or an error or time limit exceeded, that's also an option. And it is important to know that this is not a reproducibility study because we don't really uh, math, we don't really know what should be the result of this code re-execution, so we cannot match whether we got something that we expected or not. So this is more kind of like a, of a code quality study. Can we, is this code rerunnable? Is it re-executable? Re so this is the results that we get. So uh, with our code, there are like so many, uh, there are like, uh, well, you can see there are 4,500 uh, uh, our code files at Dataverse. And uh, 
And we, when we try to re-execute them with three different versions of R, these are the results that we get. So it is around 20 to 25%. But OK, when we combine these results and take the best out of three, we actually get quite a decent success rate, so around 47% of the re-execution. Uh, so what are, why is this happening? What are the most common errors? Um, so, okay, so this actually, uh, so on the left-hand side, we start. Uh, these are the files that we have, so um, 2,300 files. And then we rerun these files without installing any libraries. And then uh, we see in an Anaconda environment that is already pretty uh, bloated. And then we see we get uh, many errors. But then if we kind of like scan for these uh, typical errors and do a little bit of code cleaning, we improve this re-execution rate and some of the previous errors are now either successes or they, they actually, uh, these first errors are just mask other errors later in the code. So you can see that library errors are dominant and path uh, problems are also dominant. Um, Right. Then we try to do the same thing on Python. So what's happening when we try to re-execute Python files uh, with two different versions of Python and the results are uh, similar. So we have like around 20, 25% uh, um, of the success rate uh, or 27 when we combine these ones. And then if we aggregate this, these results per data set and say like, okay, we have a success data set if only one file re-executes we also get like a higher success rate though this is a little bit um, yeah different um, so yeah this aggregated data set essentially is just if one file re-executes successfully then we call the whole data set uh, successful and here you can see that this uh, pool of python files is much smaller than with r files meaning that r is more uh, popular uh, programming language uh, for dataverse users so what does these results tell us? They tell us that code from data repositories is not easily reusable. Uh, that means that, um, so we also see here that fixed paths are common and that's something that we can easily maybe solve, but ultimately um, R and Python uh, code is not always backwards compatible and we don't have a way how to how to uh, effectively document these dependencies. So uh, actually what, what uh, I did with this Python code is that I um, tried to find this requirements file that is typically used to document uh, dependencies. And when the, uh, this requirements file is present, we can see an uh, increase in re-execution rate, but it is still not enough. It is still not like 100%. It is still not easy. So, um, so yeah, we, the point is that we have a lack of support for code dependencies in data repositories. Um, yeah, and especially because, for example, with R, there is no, where, whereas for Python, we know that we want to use the requirements, the text, for example, to record these uh, dependencies. For R, there is no standardized way to do this, right? So it is much harder. So, and this is, of course, not a new result. We already know this for a couple, of, for many years that that there are low, uh, low reprodu uh, research reproducibility rates and that essentially the way how we disseminate code right now is not enough to, to have a, a, to enable reproducibility. So um, of course this led to an emergence of new tools that uh, and containers, uh, well, new tools that also use containers, but uh, say containers, they capture um, necessary system dependencies and can vastly improve reproducibility and code uh, rerunability. So containers are portable and shareable. And, uh, and as I mentioned, there are new tools that now integrate containers. So essentially containers, the, the vir virtual containers and machine technology is quite complex to use for, for, for uh, many researchers. This, this is why we have like a more user-friendly tools that now enable uh, the use of containers kind of like behind the scenes. And these ones are CodeOcean, Holtail, Renku, and I'm sure you, um, you, you heard about many of them. So uh, what's happen what is happening if we want to just keep a container um, in, a, in a data repository? So it would actually 
be a fair black box, if you ask me, because uh, if we uh, look back to fair principles, we, um, so yeah, this would be a fair, fair solution. So storing exported container images in, directly in data repository. And if we look back at uh, uh, fair principles, so we see that with good metadata, uh, the documents, what is inside of the container, this bundle can be fair, right? And with uh, all the things that are necessary there uh, to, to document, including licenses and so on. Um, well, okay, it is true that maybe now we don't have support for all of the, all of the compo components, metadata support for all of the components, but in theory, it can be fair because also it also does not need to be immediately accessible like we see with some of the proprietary data sets. So this is an option. This is an option for data repositories to improve uh, uh, fairness is to kind of like have a uh, focus on metadata and just document everything that's in the containers in metadata. However, um, I would like to kind of like make us more parallel in between what is reproducible with versus reusable. So containers are ultimately kind of like black boxes and we can sure keep containers on data repositories and then download them, retrieve them, and then have some like button click, say container run, uh, and then get results. But this does not, sure, and then we can see, okay, re-executing the, uh, the same commands, we get the same, same uh, out outcome, same plots, which, is, which means that these results are reproducible. But can we learn from this? Can we reuse some of the data sets? Can we reuse some of the functions or code? So I think this is not reusable. And I think that, um, yeah, there is more reuse reusable approach would be where we see what's happening inside of this black box and we see how the files are, are, what files are there, what scripts are there, what's happening. So, so what I'm trying to say here is that there is value in viewing this research data and code from, a browser, which is really also like a privilege, is, um, and this is also something that we have right now in data, Dataverse, for example. This is a view from Dataverse. We can see that there are many different files, and ideally we can kind of like pick and choose what we need. We can just reuse one data set or uh, one code file, whatever we want. And there is value in this. So um, what I'm trying to say is that, that, um, that by preserving a black box, and while documenting it, we may be, we might be going like one step backward. Um, whereas on the other hand side, this everything here is available in the browser. So um, this was a discussion at uh, Dataverse, and then we invited some uh, great experts to tell us what they're what they are working on and when they're what they're thinking about. So uh, we invited a team from um, who works on Jupyter Binder, and um, he told us that essentially how Binder does it is that um, essentially we don't need to have this black box. We can, we can still keep this, uh, this smaller files that preserve a, a environment like a, like requirement file and then Binder automatically generates a detailed Docker file with many, many lines of code. And these uh, Docker files can actually stand the test of time. And uh, so essentially that would boil down to this. We would have a say requirements file that is really complicated. Uh, I mean, okay, not necessarily, but this documents all the dependencies, but then based on that file, uh, Binder would create this uh, a more uh, robust uh, Docker file that end container that is uh, maybe future proof. And that is a really great solution. And that is something that probably is now preferred solution in Dataverse because Dataverse supports essentially having all these files and it would be very lightweight, small files. Uh, so that's definitely uh, a good solution and it would be fair. So that's, uh, th that's definitely an option. Then uh, we had a talk on uh, about Reprozip. So Reprozip is a tool that um, uh, enables advanced provenance tracking and command line recording and encapsulation. And we would have this bundle uh, also in an additional file, kind of like in a black box, but uh, how it can be preserved as, um, it can be actually stored in 
data repositories in addition to these basic files. So in addition to some code and, da and data and code book and so on, a repository bundle could be uh, saved, which is also uh, a good option, though these then bundles would be a little bit bigger than just the files. They would be like maybe about one gigabyte or something, but and also they would need to be um, recorded in metadata. So that would be also a fair option. Then we have um, we had a talk on um, Singularity. So that's a new container technology that supports uh, uh, supercomputers and HPC. Um, it is read-only, uh, also encapsulates uh, environments, uh, code um, dependencies, and it can be portable and reproducible. And there are some new features in, uh, in Singularity that, for example, are not typical for Docker containers. So, um, um, such a feature is, for example, inspect, and then where we can find out more about like, uh, 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 we can see more what are the metadata and labels of this. We can see how we can see a recipe of this container also uh, easily, which is a huge plus. And we can also have our own help commands to learn more about uh, this container. And given that Singularity containers, Artemis, are also black boxes, this is a, a, a huge upgrade that we can learn a lot um, by, for example, inspecting this container or by having some of the more uh, user-friendly instructions. Um, uh, finally, we had a talk about uh, on, um, on the project EASY, which is uh, infrastructure and services for software emulation, uh, sharing documentation, the discovery and access. And it is mainly uh, focused on legacy research and, um, and, um, and it also supports uh, proprietary software, which is a huge plus and unusual for many of, many of the tools. And this is a fantastic solution for a long-term preservation because we can kind of like create all these uh, environments from Microsoft and then reproduce these, uh, these um, uh, results that are maybe created back in the day. Um, so I just want to give like a half-time summary. So what we learned uh, here. So we learned that reproducibility is a huge problem in science and this is kind of separate from fair principles that we have in data repositories. And also um, we want to improve reproducibility, but we also want to enable long-term preservation for scientific research. And these are uh, great tools that can solve uh, many of these problems. Um, and they can be fair uh, with good metadata. These are also like fair options. However, we uh, still want to kind of like insist on this like ease of access for data and code, maybe from the browser and so on. So some of these tools might be might behave more uh, like a black box than the others. So now I want to kind of like pitch my solution, my, my idea for data repositories. So I think that I think that data repositories should look up to software repositories like GitHub and GitLab um, and uh, just in, and have a, a sister container registry. I think that would be a good solution. And I know what you're thinking now. There are many different types of containers. So this solution would actually look like this, right? So we would need to, uh, data repository would need to have a registry for Docker, a registry for Singularity and so on. So yeah, that is true. But also we could have a, another model, maybe a model like this, because I mentioned that there are already about 60, uh, 64 maybe dataverses around the world, just dataverses. So dataverse instances. So if each of these dataverse instances use the same registry, then um, yeah, same types of registry to, to, to put their containers, that's, that's, that could be a valid option. So then, yeah, this, that would minimize maybe the expenses that each of the, these repositories would need to, uh, to have. Um, but there's also another option, and this is a future model. So we could have a multi-purpose registry for containers. So many um, repositories 
produce a registry that actually can store uh, different types of containers, like a Docker container and Singularity container. And this, this is still not a reality, but with uh, standardization of containers and uh, open container initiative, this is, this, is, uh, this is happening. This is in progress. Um, this is work in progress. OK. So um, OK, so this solution in practice. What, what, how would, what would be the implementation? So we would have a data repository, say, and a container registry. And we would have data encoded as usual. Uh, and these, uh, these data encodes would be seen as usual in data repositories. Then we would probably need to have a container recipe, so how to build all these dependencies. And we would also want to preserve the whole container so that we know that we can that it is there, that we won't have problems rebuilding this recipe into a new container. So yeah, that is, that is probably a good implementation. However, to, to make this fair, we need to have metadata to document this container recipe and to document this container image on the registry. So yeah, and this metadata, we, there are still no like, recognize standards how to document this in metadata. However, I have a good news for, for, uh, for other container enthusiasts like myself. This is currently being developed and discussed. So here we have a, a kind of like a draft of a container image uh, schema metadata and a sister schema for the container recipe. So this is uh, currently being discussed and um, they are inviting people to comment with this and maybe give their suggestions so that, um, so yes, if this is of interest to you, uh, have a look at this uh, um, draft. So what are the good outcomes of this solution? So it has a potential to vastly improve reproducibility and re uh, reusability for smaller scale studies, right? So especially if this is like a study on like my computer where I just use R and have a few and have smaller uh, data sets, uh, this can easily be encapsulated in Docker and then sent back to, sent to, um, to Dataverse, for example. And it is not too late to encapsulate old code. So there are many um, uh, these um, data sets that contain R and Python code, and this can be still kind of like maybe automatically encapsulated and uh, and improve their their re-execution could be improved that way. Uh, and also, what would be kind of like a good uh, side effect of this uh, of uh, enabling uh, of enabling of having containers is that now because uh, for example, Singularity supports HPC. If uh, if uh, data repositories also support Singularity, that that means that they would also be able to capture um, and disseminate. Uh, computing results from these different infrastructures like HPC, which is kind of like previously somewhere in the gray zone, right? How do we document HPC? Uh, how do we disseminate this research on, on data repositories? And also this would allow easy integration with other reproducibility tools that are also based on containers. And yeah, some of them I, I uh, mentioned in the previous slide, some of them just in my introduction. Uh, many of these tools are actually also based in containers. so. There would be an easy way to to integrate this and um, and store actually these containers for a longer term. So of course there are, there are problems uh, and these problems are so while data repositories handle handle really well uh, metadata standards and they can integrate multiple metadata standards. Setting up a container registry is more complicated and expensive. And here we can see a screenshot actually from Docker Hub that um, that now has like a purge period and they're going to delete many of the containers that was there uh, maybe for, for some years. And for example, I have, I have several containers on Docker Hub and I never thought that they would just like delete them like that. So that's a good, good way. To, uh, yeah, it is um, kind of like a reality check understanding that this is actually expensive to keep all these containers and that of course they are going to delete them at some point. Uh, and we want to have some more a sustainable solution than this. So uh, what are kind of like potential solutions to alleviate this situation and to improve? How can we make this uh, like more realistic? 
So for example, we can have standardized containers for, uh, for uh, repository users. So these would have, say, uh, base, uh, same base layers, which means that they would use less storage than if all of them were completely different. Um, then, um, uh, yeah, then containers generated by uh, this uh, reproducibility platforms are also um, standardized. And uh, another good thing is that data repositories already uh, captured, they have good support to, uh, for sensitive data and for, for, for proprietary data. So this could also be the case for proprietary containers, right? We don't want to have them like in the open because that would be a pirating software, but there are still ways that uh, uh, to keep them um, kind of like behind an authentication. And it is also what the data repositories now do uh, quite well. So finally, um, I would like to um, conclude by saying that um, we identify this problem. So code on data repositories creates needs to, to adequately support it. And many options are possible and they're fair. Uh, however, in my uh, personal view, I think that best way is to invest in container registry. And I think that that would be a good uh, long-term solution. And now with, with um, new uh, metadata, I think that would be possible. And I, and this is kind of like uh, um, this is kind of like my recent train of thought, and I'm like thinking about this now actively. And I would be curious to hear what are, what is your take on this. So we are going to have a half an hour after the talks, and I would be interested to to talk and to hear what people are thinking about this. So yeah, I think this is uh, everything, and thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, we are. Uh, this project is funded by Sloan, so also thank you to them. Uh, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Anna. Can we have a virtual round of applause for Anna? I think there are reaction buttons as well with, with applause if you'd like to do that. Um, we'll take time for one quick question um, and then any other questions can just be uh, directed at you in the chat. Uh, Philip, did you wanna unmute and ask your question? Or shall I ask your question? I'll ask your question. Uh, so in the comments. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, it's just a simple question. I mean, you did your analysis for the real vulnerability of the code of Python 3.5, which is uh, depreciated for quite some um, software packages nowadays. So the question is whether you expect different results if you extend maybe Python 3.7 or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure if I heard well the, the question. So, um, I mean, I so uh, you're saying that uh, testing the code on 3. Uh, Python 3.5 was not a good idea. Um, and it, and if I'm uh, thinking of testing uh, again uh, on Python 3.7, is that uh, is that the question? Yes. Um, um, well, not for now, not for now. Though I think that uh, so yeah, I, that would be a, a good idea. I think, especially because here we can see that we really benefited from having tested. Uh, three different versions of R, right? When we integrate these results and say like, okay, let's let's take the best of these three results, we we learn that we actually uh, find a good um, environment and the, a matching software for uh, for most of these uh, for for higher number of uh, data data sets. So it would be good to investigate also in. Um, in Python, in different versions of Python. And I'm sure that then the combined result would be better. But this is not something that I would uh, maybe do right now. Um, yeah, one of the reasons is that uh, my uh, AWS credits ran out. <laughs> but yeah, that would be maybe a good test. But I think that this, this would be particularly, uh, say, important if we, if we really want to integrate and have uh, different containers, then it would be good to to try to kind of like revive this old uh, software, this old code and try to find the matching environment for this. And then in that case would be good to try to test as many different Python versions as possible so we can find to, so we can match 
this code uh, to the right uh, environment, kind of automatically. But okay, another option would be to to read what's happening there and to try to match also the release here to what Python was used at that time. So there are several options, but uh, yeah, definitely also automatically um, that would be one 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 option. Thank you. Yeah, I hope that I answer the question, but uh, I'm also happy to follow up uh, later. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just ask everybody to direct any more questions uh, for Anna in the chat and hopefully she can answer them there. Um, we'll give her one final round of applause. And now 